combine this public and private one trillion dollars in assets hello everybody welcome back to value tokenized with Masha and Zainia today we have a very interesting tech and legal perspective from Richard Lachwasser CEO of Lithium who are set to create the standard private public blockchain solution for a business Lydian's token sale starts this Thursday, and Richard also told us why they choose ICO over an STO. So hi, Richard. Thank you very much for being with us today at Value Tokenize. And you're currently piloting a 20 million euro syndicated loan between two Garbank cooperatives and a real estate development company. Can you tell us more about this initiative and the Lydian's role in this? Yes, absolutely. So we are really excited because, you know, our objective in Lithium is to bring blockchains to the mass market, to bring it away from the niche utilities, away from just single use cases, but bring it into our everyday lives. And we thought, okay, what use cases are there where the whole world can benefit and not just a few crypto world so that in five or 10 years from now, Crypto is just as normal as internet is today. That's our vision. So we went into the VR bank. VR bank, that's a conglomerate of municipality banks. They have around $1 trillion in assets. So a really large bank. Um, and we together with, with, with two branches, we had a couple of discussions on um, what we can do to actually use the blockchain to solve real life pain points. One of these real life pain points is syndicated loans. Now syndicated loans, that's basically a bit like peer to peer trading, just that the lenders are not normal people or not retail people, but they are banks. So in our case, there was a loan of 20 million euros and of around 20 million euros, a little bit more. That's the real estate in Munich, by the way. And banks uh, weren't able to serve this loan by themselves, so they teamed up. And this right now, it's a quite a difficult process. You know, the banks, they pick up the phone, they ask the neighboring bank, they say, oh, I have a 20 million, do you want, maybe want to take five or six? Ah, what's, what's the exchange rate? What, what's, the, this, what's the rate you can give me? Then they exchange faxes, then they write contracts, exchange faxes again. Then they say, ah, oh, sorry, I can only take two. No, two is enough. Then they call up the next bank and ask them, oh, I still have another four or five. Do you want to maybe join in? And it's a very, well, how do I word this? Traditional process, I would say, which has worked for many, many, many decades. But in times of private keys, asynchronous security, and also stable coins, for example, it's, it's a lot easier. This is actually a beautiful use case where we've now developed a, a minimal viable product, which we will release very shortly to the public, where every bank uses the private key uh, to sign in into a blockchain application, a DApp or a decentralized app, um, where they align the conditions, where you have a central source of truth, um, and which all runs on the Lithium blockchain, because also that's a nice use case, because obviously when you sign up for a bank, I mean, you as a person applying for the loan, you give away everything. Eh? You give away your wealth, your personal savings, your bank account volumes, your credit score, everything. You don't want that to be in a public blockchain. And that fits nicely with Lithium's public-private approach. And can you tell us more about the private-public approach by the private-public blockchain? Because there's been a whole discussion on the market, which one is better? And you seem to combine this two. Yes, true. So there were a lot of discussions, like we have lots of public blockchains like Ethereum, that's the most common one, or EOS, and then you have many private blockchains uh, like Hyperledger, for example. And you know, they're good projects, don't get me wrong. And I think they're, depending on the use case, you might go with a public blockchain or with a private blockchain. Um, but we've found that there are many use cases which aren't just private or just public, but they have some private elements Let's take the bank example again. Some private elements like your personal credit score. But then you also have some public elements like an official approval from the bank stating to a potential uh, uh, landlord, for example, that this loan has been given to this person. And we thought, and we've tried to search the market, but we didn't find solutions that combine this public and private 
uh, in these public and private use cases at the same time efficiently. And that's basically the lithium solution. So technically, we have, an, we have one public blockchain. We use Ethereum for that as an anchor where we store hashes of information. So where we basically have a, it's like a notary. Mm -hmm. And then we have an unlimited amount of private side chains where all of this private information is stored. And depending on which data you want to use, you just go through the private blockchain or you put it into the private blockchain and then store the hashes into the public blockchain uh, so that you can make information verifiable by anyone. And why did you choose Ethereum in the first place? Yeah, we looked at a couple of other options, but Ethereum is just the de facto standard for decentralized applications today. And we wanted to make sure that it's very easy to migrate. Actually, our first use case, energy peer-to-peer -peer trading, which we started about half a year ago, it was developed on Ethereum. And so we also said, come on, if we develop a new blockchain, it would be easy if migration is easy. And now it's so simple. Now we just use the same source code, not deployed to Ethereum, but deploy to our private sidechain, and it's working. But um, one of your stated goals is to develop this uh, like um, second layer um, that will be universal for multiple blockchains. And when do you think um, the technology will be advanced enough uh, to achieve that? Um, good question. So you're right. We started off with Ethereum. Um, I would say we the, the mainnet launch, which is publicly scheduled for the third quarter of this year, then we will still stick with Ethereum and then see how Ethereum develops. If the so-called Plasma protocol, that's a new upgrade, so to say, of, of Ethereum, which is a lot more efficient, which reduces transaction costs, then Ethereum might actually be a good solution also for the longer term. Otherwise, we will look into other blockchains and also think about the way to support multiple blockchains. Because, you know, technically, you have a private chain and the private chain needs to store some information in a public place. In it, this information that is stored in a public place, basically the hashes of these blocks, it doesn't really matter if they store it to one location or to another location. Technically, it's just, it's just a deposit of data. So it's also technically quite easy to use a different main chain other than Ethereum for us. Can you tell us more about how you comply with European general data protection rules? Yeah, we realized that's um, very important for our, for our for European com companies, because if you don't apply to GDPR or to the data protection rules, um, then you can find uh, for millions and millions of euros of fees um, up to 4% of global revenue, uh, which is would kill, of course, kill, but severely damage uh, large companies. Um, and as we're looking into corporate audiences with and uh, the our bank with $1 trillion in assets, you can probably, that fits that corporate category, it needs to be bulletproof on all areas. And um, now the core of the GDP, of the general data protection rule says, if, if a citizen gives private data to a company, and the company doesn't need the data anymore, so for example, at the end of the contract or after the loan has expired, then the individual citizen can tell the company to delete the data. Yeah. So far, so good, but how do you delete data from a blockchain? <laughs> I mean, they were not made to be deleted. <laughs> so that was quite tricky. And um, the way we solved it, um, in these private side chains, we actually have um, two separate storage elements. We have, we have a blockchain element, which just stores the hashes of the data, and we have a distributed database, which stores the, the data. And whenever you send a transaction, the transaction is always split into the hashes, which is stored in the blockchain, and the data, which is stored in the distributed database. And they're always interlinked. So the cool thing is with that, when you delete the data, the hashes still stay there. So you still have the benefits of a blockchain, like you cannot change the data because you would immediately get other, other hashes. You can trace every transaction back. If you change a transaction somewhere in the middle, the whole blockchain wouldn't, be, wouldn't, be, wouldn't work anymore. So you get the benefits of a blockchain while still being able to delete data. That was a little bit of the, of the trick, or not the trick, but I would say the special architecture choice that we, that we used in order to make sure we have a legally usable blockchain because we all love technology, but if the technology will not be used, it doesn't matter how 
genius it is, you know, it will just not be used in the real world. That's why we said, okay, you know, we're all technology guys and we love blockchain, but we need to find solutions to make this this tech, this blockchain technology come into the real world. And that's a lot more important than being a technology evangelist and then just sticking yeah. to the visibility. Yeah, it's probably this dispute about uh, like the original concept of decentralization and then practical application yeah. of the real world. That's true. And but we're, but we're still decentralized. So every blockchain, yeah. every sidechain, of course, still decentralized. Um, and there is no no authority like some other blockchains, which just always knows the truth. It is a real consensus protocol, uh, but with the twist uh, that deletability is possible. For example, if we take um, some traditional business, um, like either it's, for example, like owner of uh, real estate, um, how would you describe the benefits of blockchain technology, how it can be used like to those who can who never ever dealt with that before and what are like the real benefits as of now let's take a practical case um, i'm an owner of real estate and i want to sell that real estate to another person in reality what happens now is i have a very long contract with a bank to give me money and get, get a loan i have a very long contract with the uh, owner of the property that I want to buy, for example, I have four, five, six documents that I need to exchange with the, um, with the land plot registry of the city, with the tax department, with the um, various other governmental and municipality bodies that take care of this. And when I want to transfer something, I have to go to a notary, the notary reads all of this and then after where everything's fine, we sign. This is very expensive. Um, now in Germany, the transaction costs when you buy, when you buy a property around 2%. So let's say you have a, our 20 million property, which, which we has, uh, have as a, as a pilot, 2% of that. I mean, that's, you know, that's a lot of money. That's 200,000 euros just gone in transaction costs. And the concept of Bitcoin was transferring money without a bank. Security tokens bring you to the next level. Transferring securities like a property without all the stuff in the, in the middle. That's the future. That's the long-term vision that you give me my wallet. I send, it, I send the ownership of the security tokens to you and you immediately have our owner of this asset. Now, this is the long-term future. We're not there yet. Um, but I think that's that's where we should work to because it takes out there's so many unnecessary middlemen that are just with modern technology can just be overcome. Can you tell us why you decided on to have an ICO that is being launched like next week, but instead of an ESTO because you could have done like both and you still choose an ICO? Why did you do that? So STOs, the future, I think the future belongs to STOs. That's very clear. There are so many advantages to it. Like, like in the example I, I just brought with the, with, the, with the house. But you can do the same thing with, with equity or with cars or, you know, basically any security or with bonds or law. But the legal regulation that we have right now with security tokens just isn't there yet. So when we were about... Um, uh, several months ago, when we were looking into our own token emission, we also thought should we emission utility tokens or security tokens. Made a lot of discussions with lawyers, a lot of discussions with governments. Um, and now we are incorporated legally in Liechtenstein. The thing is, if you emission a security token in Liechtenstein, you first need to write an offering mem memorandum or prospectus. Now, this has many, many, many pages outlining many, many, many risks and costs a lot of lawyer hours. But then you need to get approval from the country of Liechtenstein that this is fine, which is, takes, of course, a few weeks, months. Um, for us, for our, just for our, our utility token, took three months approval time. Now think what would happen with the security token. Yeah. But then when you have an approval, you can sell it to the citizens of Liechtenstein. And maybe you know Liechtenstein, there are like 30,000 Liechtensteiners out there. 30,000. I live in Berlin. Berlin is 100 times as large, 3 million. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you get, the, you get the picture. Now, of course, we could apply for EU-wide passporting, but then you would only be able to sell in the European Union. Um, 
if you go, don't go do it Liechtenstein, but you go to some rogue country like uh, Panama or Cayman Islands, you, of course, you can do whatever you want. But if you want to really be, if you are a legitimate company and you want to do real serious business, you don't want to go down that, that route. So I think before we have some international standards on security tokens, or at least some general accepted practices, that's already, that's already enough. Um, then I think there would be a lot, a lot better. Or, sorry, or you have a very localized product, like a product that is only works within a certain country. Sure, then you get approval for that certain country, and then you do the, and then you allow trading for, for retail investors and citizens of that country. But in our case, we have a global product which works all over the world. Our community is truly global. It would have never, it would have never worked. And uh, you mentioned that the regulation's not there yet, but a lot of countries are actually um, trying their best to get one ready. And you are an advisor for German uh, government on the legal framework for SDOs. Can you tell us what does this role imply and uh, how, does, um, how does it work? What do you do? No, I'm very glad, by the way, that the German government has written in the coalition contract. So that's basically the, the blueprint that a new government, that a new um, ruling party or ruling coalition defines what laws they want to do during the period, so during the next four years. And their blockchain was a central element. Blockchain was mentioned as one of the key enablers for digitalization. And now the German government is consequent and they say, okay, let's, let's get this rolling. But the German government is also asking experts in this field for help. And so far, and we've been involved in the drafting of the uh, of the law, so we were able to give feedback um, to parliament members. Or in two weeks, for example, I'll be in the German Bundestag uh, in an expert panel, and 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 speak about the announcement. Will come out very soon, by the way. Uh, so this this is actually a first announcement. This because it's brand new information. You are the first ones to get to know this. <laughs> yeah. So um, these are like the ways where we as a heavily involved startup in security tokens uh, can provide this information and plays both ways. I mean, the German government gets a law which is actually used in practice and we, we make sure that we develop our technology solution in such a way that it will be fully legally compliant and can then later on be used by companies. And you think that this new initiative to um, approve um, blockchain-based securities to give them the same status as paper securities. Do you think it will happen or we'll still need to wait to see this happen? Because there is, for, for example, in the US, we see some, um, some deals um, and what they do is they, they took nice you know, securities, but they still offer the uh, opportunity, yeah, yeah. opportunity for physical settlements. And the majority of investors still go for physical because they're just not sure in uh, tokens. Um, in the end, it's a trust question. What do you trust more? Um, you know, I would say 60, 70 years ago, people trusted gold the most. Yeah. If two or 300 years ago, people trusted pigs and eggs the most. Now, people trust the, the coin, the, you know, the physical bill and the coin most. Yeah. In five years from now, people trust what's in the PayPal account most. And also now, if you trust what, if PayPal tells you you have money in your account, you trust it. Wait another 10 years. When you look on the blockchain and you see something like, oh, okay, it tells me like, is that, well, it then really is like that. And I'm pretty sure that's exactly what, what will happen. It's just a matter of time. Thank you very much um, for, for this fun interview. <laughs> yeah, for your amazing sense of humor and for, for a lot of this valuable information. This is very interesting. You'll hear a lot from us. <laughs> no, Masha and Xenia, thank you so much for this interview. Actually, I, I really enjoyed the talk with the two of you guys. So, um, and it's also good that you pushed this, this topic because we are security tokens, there's such a huge potential in there. Um, and, yeah. you know, it's like a sleeping giant just being ready to be woke, woken up.